It is difficult to preach after you was crying through a whole song. I'm just going to go ahead and acknowledge that. Uh, if I haven't had the chance to meet you, I go by Ant. I serve as the pastor here uh, at Midtown Two Notch. Thank you so much. Can we shout out to the guests that are here with us today? <laughs> Amen. Very glad. Very glad you chose to worship with us and gather with us today. We, we, we pray and trust and believe that you'll be blessed by the word of God as it is preached today. We're continuing on in our sermon series on the book of Acts. If you've got a Bible, feel free to go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 20. Uh, we'll get there in a second. We'll do a little bit of setup before uh, we get there. In this sermon series on the book of Acts, uh, ever since chapter 1, verse 8, which I believe to be the thesis of the book, we've been talking about what it looks like to live as a witness of Christ, that he has already made us into his witnesses. How do we live that out? How do we embody that? How do we embrace this identity that he has given us? I want to start by reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'll read verse 2, and then I'll read the first part of verse 4. It reads, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay heart to it. Verse 4 reads, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of Mirth. The term mirth means to be maybe ecstatic or very joyful or very cheerful. It says the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. What the author here, Solomon, is writing in the book of Ecclesiastes is he's showing us that it is a foolish practice to keep yourself away from grief. It is a foolish practice to keep yourself away from acknowledging the reality of death. When we talk about grief, particularly referring to the loss of life, we learn from this, these verses, it is wise to be in the house of mourning, to acknowledge death for what it is. And I believe there's a lot we can gain by considering and understanding and remaining mindful of the fact that for all of us, this life will come to an end. I was uh, talking to uh, another pastor um, and he told me that when he was younger, one of the things that he would do, because he noticed how much it would help his perspective on his own life, is that time he would spend time in graveyards. That he would look at the tombstones that he sees, that he would look at the, the dates that are on there and the dash, the hyphen between the dates of birth and death, and just consider maybe what happened in that, in that dash period. How did this person live their life? Were they uh, a parent? Were they a brother or a sister? Were they an aunt or an uncle? How did they live their life? What did they prioritize? What type of things might they have endured? And he said it helps to give him perspective on his own life, and it causes him to uh, maybe uh, ask himself the question, am I living in such a way that the, that hyphen, that dash in my life, when one day I have a tombstone, that it will be what I ultimately desire for it to be? How do I live such that my life in the end of it amounts to everything that I desire for it to amount to? Are my day-to-day -day practices, the things that I find myself doing, the, thing, the, the patterns in my, life, in my life, do they line up with what I want that dash to be for me? I believe Solomon is letting us know in Ecclesiastes it is wise to spend time in the house of mourning and consider our own lives in light of that. Today in Acts chapter 20, we get to read uh, what I would consider a bit of a house of mourning for the Apostle Paul. He is not, it's not that he's about to die right now, but as we'll see when we get into the text here uh, in chapter 20, is that these are some of his last words with some very near and dear friends to him, and he's looking back over and considering his time with them. He's considering and remembering, I should say, how he spent those three years with them. And I say that this is like a house of mourning because, as we'll see in this passage, the Apostle Paul lets them know that he will not see them again in this life. This is the last time he will see them. He knows what God is calling to and will get into. And as he's recounting, it reminds us of a bit of the things that I would believe a house of mourning might remind us of as well. And my prayer is that as we visit Paul's house of mourning here, that we'll seek to gain wisdom for our lives as we draw out just a couple points from some of his reflections that we have here. Acts chapter 20, starting at verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. 
So Miletus is located probably about 45 miles or so outside of Ephesus. He sends word to the leaders of the church in Ephesus to come to him. And here's what he says. And when they came to him, verse 18, when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia. He says that from the first day he entered Asia, they know what his life was like. Now, the Apostle Paul is going to highlight some specific things that he's done, but I don't want us to miss the main thing that he's saying here. He's, not, he's going to go through some things that he's done. But he's not giving them new information here. He is reminding them of things that they have already seen in him. He's saying, you know my life. He says, from the first day I got here in Asia, you know what happened to me. The first lesson that I want to draw out from Paul's house of mourning is that he openly shared his life with others. He openly shared his life with others. Paul is saying, you know my life. He's saying, you had a front row seat to my life. And here, then he goes on to share, you know, what they know about his life. Verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. He's saying through all the difficulties, you know about the difficult things I went through. Right? He didn't act like everything in his life was going the way that he might have wanted it to go. He shared his sufferings. He shared his low points. He shared the pains that he endured. Verse 20, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. He says, you know about my ministry. You know what it looked like for me to follow Christ and live and fulfill the things that he had called me to do. Verse 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, you saw that I didn't withhold anything from you all that was good for you. I taught everyone and called everyone to repent and place faith in Jesus. The Apostle Paul found it to be appropriate and good to give people himself as he gave them Jesus. He found it to be good and appropriate to give those that he ministered to himself as he gave them Jesus. This was very much common practice for the Apostle. He did the same thing with the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, I'll read it in the CSB. He says, we cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become dear to us. Family, if you are desiring to practice truly biblical Christian fellowship, if you are desiring to be as effective and fruitful as possible as a witness of Christ, if you are desiring to truly flourish, I would even say as a human being, you are going to have to be willing to share your life with others. The work that Christ has done in our hearts and in our lives, it runs deep. It affects our motivations, our desires, our moment-by-moment -moment practices. He affects how we live and act and respond in times of rejoicing, in times of stress, in times of sadness, in times of confusion, in times of gratitude. All of it, he affects every aspect of our lives and the body of Christ will not flourish and bear witness to Christ as effectively as we could if we all seek to isolate and live extremely private lives. Because if we do so, then we are not actually putting on display the work of God in our lives. Because as I said just a moment ago, he affects every aspect of our lives. He affects every, every layer of our lives, our, our relationships, our motivations, our, our desires, everything. His, he comes and his reign and his authority affects every part of our lives. And so if we are to be helping others to grow in the faith, if we are to grow in the faith the way that God desires for us too, we are to share our lives with others. That is a way to truly be a witness of Christ as we share what he has done in us and through us. The Apostle Paul is talking about how they know his life, his tears, his trials, and how he lived. And he's saying this to all the Ephesian elders, not just the ones who he naturally clicked with. Not just the ones that he naturally clicked with. The Apostle Paul knows that to have a bond with Christ is also to have a bond with his brothers and sisters that are in Christ. To truly bond with Christ is to truly bond with his body and those who are in him. To be a part of the body of Christ is to be connected to the other parts of the body, whether we would naturally gravitate towards them or not. 
part of being part part of being a part of the body of Christ means that no matter who we naturally gravitate towards, Christ in Himself pulls us towards His family, pulls us towards His our brothers and sisters in Christ, pulls us towards those who are in Him. And the Apostle Paul shared his life with others. And while I'm here, I want to break down 1 Thessalonians 2, 8 really quickly because we need to notice the motivations here. We need to notice what caused the apostle to be pleased to share his life with the Thessalonians. Verse 8, he says, We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. There's two motivations. The first one is we cared so much for you. The second one is because you have become so dear to us. This leads him to not only share the the gospel of God, but also his own life. I want to pay attention to what the Apostle Paul doesn't say. He does not say we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives because we agreed on everything. He does not say because we come from the same type of background or we're of the same race or we have the same interests in life or because our personalities naturally click well together. He did not say because we're in the same stage of life or because your life circumstances are similar to mine. He does not say because you're never draining and you're always easy to talk to. Those are not the reasons that he gives. No, he points straight to his heart. He points straight to the love that he has in Christ. He says, because we cared so much for you, because you have become dear to us. He points to his love for the reason that you shared his life with those he he is ministering to. And we need to consider who is saying this. This is arguably the greatest apostle in the history of the body of Christ. It's one of the greatest models that we have biblically of following Jesus. It's showing us that one of his most consistent practices as he lived as a witness of Christ was to deeply share his life with others. Fellowship and discipleship are life on life. Growing as a Christian isn't just about learning more lessons about God. Oftentimes, more is caught than is taught. Oftentimes, when it comes to following Christ, more is caught than is taught. Oftentimes, we grow more by having true personal insight and interaction with how someone lives their life as a follower of Jesus than we learn from hearing someone speak and teach. Our discipleship, our, the way we understand discipleship can't be just centered around hearing good preachers or good speakers teach about God or going to enough Bible studies, but no, the way the Bible models discipleship and growing in Christ is always in fellowship with other believers. For some of us, I really believe, I really believe we need to analyze our busyness. I really believe we need to analyze and question our business. Listen, and, and a lot of times the things that we're doing, they, they, they might be great things, but I'm just saying we got to ask the question. I'm just saying we got to ask ourselves, we got to interrogate ourselves and ask us that is, is, are, are, are our schedules and the things to, that we commit ourselves to, are we overly committing ourselves? I know there's something that I struggle with. It can be very easy for me to accept responsibility after responsibility and it spreads me thin and, I don't, and it's more difficult for me, at least I should say, to walk in fellowship with believers as God would call me to. For some of us, we just need to be real. We got, we, got, we got walls and trust issues. We got walls up and we got trust issues. So we isolate ourselves because if we're honest, we find the pain of isolation to be safer than the pain and difficulty of walking in true fellowship with others. We often find the, the, the pain and the difficulty of isolation to be safer than the pain of having our feelings hurt by someone that we let in. One of the enemies that we as Christians face is something that the Bible refers to as the world. When there's a pattern that people in our world consistently follow, when when people around us, many of the people around us are living the same way and it goes against what God has for us as his people, the Bible refers to that influence on us as the world. Some of us as Christians have embraced a very worldly mindset when it comes to relationships. We've embraced a very worldly mindset when it comes to relationships. I just, you know, I just intentionally keep a really small circle and don't let people in because people messy and trifling. I just want you to consider the stark contrast of what we see in the word of God here compared to that. I just want you to consider how different that is than the believers that we have seen throughout the book of Acts so far that are looking to portray the good news of Jesus Christ and communicate the good news of Jesus Christ. This is not how they lived. 
They welcomed those that Jesus brought to them and they built relationships with them. There was fellowship in the body of Christ. This is how the apostle Paul lived his life, knowing that he is going to be building relationships with difficult people, with people that are difficult for him to connect with, but he continues on and on to do so. That mindset of keeping people out because of the because of fear of being hurt, if we can really call it what it is. That was not the Apostle Paul's mindset, and more importantly, that wasn't Jesus' mindset. If we are going to be the witnesses he has made us to be, that can't be our mindset either. If we're going to be the kind of people that truly share our lives with others in the ways that we see Paul doing here, I believe that we need to approach relationships very differently. The Apostle Paul didn't just develop these relationships with the Ephesians for the sake of having relationships. I think we need to acknowledge that. His love for them caused him to want them to know Christ. And I believe that was a huge part of why he continued on in, this, in these relationships with them. Verse 31, I want us to look at how fervent and real and meaningful and impactful this love was that he had for them in verse, verse 31. He tells them, therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years, I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. In this sort of house of mourning that the Apostle Paul is in, as he knows he won't see the Ephesian church again in this life, he recounts for them what it was like as he lived with them. He reminds them of how for three years, night and day, he admonished everyone with tears. I want you to look at that verse. It, the, the, word, the words there, everyone, is not put together in one word, everyone. It's everyone. And so some translations actually say each one. So he's not speaking just collectively to them when he's saying, I was admonishing you with tears. He's saying, I admonish each one, every one with tears for three years, night and day without stopping, he says. He's saying that he admonished, then that word admonish means to put to mind, it means to warn, it means to exhort. I don't know if you've ever been to this place with someone before where you want something so badly for them because of how much you love them. You see the way that they're going and you just desire for them to, to, to turn course. You desire for them to remember the things that you've been teaching them or the things that they've already been taught. And your love for them is so strong and so real in that moment that as you're admonishing them, as you're encouraging them, as you're calling them to turn, as you're warning them, you get emotional in that moment because of how badly you want good for them. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying was the case for him with the Ephesian, with the Ephesian church and with the Ephesian elders. Day and night, for three years, over and over again, each one of them admonishing them, exhorting them, encouraging them to follow Christ. His love for them was, was real. The example here is not of a man who only really went deep relationally with those that were, that where it was easy for him. No, he's saying that this is, he did this, this level of love with each one of them, with each one. So I believe the question that comes to mind when I see this for me is how does this happen to someone? How does someone get to the point where they are willing to share their life and relationally open themselves up to people time and time again when they know the risk of being hurt and being portrayed and the risk of being let down and disappointed? And my conclusion as I've sought and sat in this house of mourning with the Apostle Paul as I've read through this passage time and time again is this, and this is our second point, that he approached current relationships with eternal purpose that he approached current relationships, my apologies for the typo, he approached current relationships with eternal purpose. It seems that the Apostle Paul knew nothing of a loving relationship with someone where he didn't desperately want them to know and follow and worship Jesus more. Christ is so good and was such a blessing to him that he wanted to glorify Christ and he wanted others to experience this blessing of following Christ and knowing Christ as well. And so he's motivated and compared to share his life and the gospel with, with others in spite of how difficult and painful that often is, particularly how difficult and painful it was for him. And it was an extremely difficult and painful thing to him. I think we've talked previously, I've talked previously in this series about some of the things that he has suffered physically for the sake of the gospel, but his suffering went way deeper than that. His suffering was emotional as well. He actually writes a letter to a pastor that he left there to shepherd the flock at Ephesus, whose name was Timothy. I want us to see what he wrote to, to Timothy 
In 2 Timothy, we'll, we'll read a verse in chapter 1, then a verse in chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 says, You are aware that all who are in Asia, mind you, Ephesus is in Asia. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. He's saying that they turned away from him. He had felt abandonment before, even though this was later in his life. 2 Timothy 4, 16 says, At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. That word deserted is a word that means to abandon. It means to desert. It means to leave helpless. It means to forsake. That particular word is not a word that you use for a stranger. That's not a word that you use of someone who is not with you, doesn't do something for you. No, that is a word that you use to refer to someone you had some type of a relationship with, some type of connection with, and now they are not with you in your time of need. It means to leave helpless and to forsake. He's saying that at his defense, this is likely when he was being charged incorrectly. And he says no one came to his defense in those times. Paul was no fool. He knew the risks involved with sharing his life with those in Ephesus, but he continued on because he approached current relationships with eternal purpose. Christian, you know that Christians that are in your life, maybe in your life group, that if we're being real, you just really don't like them. Never. You just really don't like them. And you know that God, you kn <laughs> if we're being real, it's Christians in your life likely that you just don't like. You know that God wants you to approach those current relationships with eternal purpose, right? Yeah. Yeah. You need to know that even that relationship, God wants you to approach it with eternal purpose. Maybe that looks like you consistently praying for them or encouraging them or engaging in acts of kindness in their life to show them the love of Christ. He wants you to approach those relationships, those current relationships with eternal purpose. Christian, you likely have people in your life that don't know Christ that you don't like. If we're being real, and you need to know that God wants you to approach that current relationship with eternal purpose. Maybe that looks like you consistently praying for them or encouraging them or engaging in acts of kindness with them to show the love of Christ to them. This is what God desires for you and your relationships. Following Jesus and being Jesus-centered means we submit our entire lives to him, including our relationships. It means that we approach our current relationships with eternal purpose. I want to jump down to verse 36. We see this again in the Apostle Paul's life as he's concluding his words to them. It says, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. As we saw earlier in the passage, the Apostle Paul was on his way back to Jerusalem. If you recall from earlier in this sermon series, Jerusalem is where the persecution first hit Christians the hardest. That's the reason that the Christians scattered abroad because of how intense the persecution was right there in Jerusalem where it all began. And now the Apostle Paul is ready to set sail and he's on his way back to Jerusalem. And he knows, he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen to him. And we'll talk about this more next week as we get into a little bit more of this chapter. He doesn't know exactly what's going to happen to them, but two things he knows. He knows he's not going to see them again in this life. And he knows that great persecution is ahead of him. Now God is calling him back to Jerusalem to continue the work of spreading the good news of Jesus. So get this, for the Apostle Paul, whether it means extending hospitality to people he's developing relationships with, which we saw in verse, eight, verse 18, or if it means him having to say goodbye to those he loves deeply, as we see in verses 36 to 38, he is approaching current relationships with eternal purpose. Whether that means an invitation and hospitality and building relationships, or whether that means him, him leaving those relationships to a degree and going somewhere else where God is calling him to go, either way he's saying, God, I submit my relationships and my life to you. I'm going to view it, whatever you are calling me to do, I'm going to view it, I'm going to approach it with eternal purpose. Apostle Paul was willing to share his life and the gospel with others that he built relationships with, and he was willing to go to other places and connect with new people for the same purpose. For, for everyone uh, that's in our church that's in a life group, this is honestly how we need to approach our life groups. 
This is the mindset, the approach that we need to have. Here at Midtown, we greatly value what we call life group multiplication. Life groups sending out key members of their life group to start a new life group so we can have more room for new people in our groups. And it's a very difficult thing oftentimes because you know, it means oftentimes sending out people that you've built great relationships with, and they're going to be in a different group now. And the, the, not that you can't still spend time with them, but you know it won't be the same. But at the same time, we know that if we don't do this, we cannot continue to welcome new people into fellowship in our groups. If you're currently in a life group, we need you to approach those current relationships with eternal purpose being willing to share your life with each other and encourage one another with God's word and being willing to multiply as a life group and send out people to start new life groups. Whether it's welcoming people in and building relationships or whether it's sending people out for the mission of God, we must approach our current relationships with eternal purposes or purpose. If you're in a life group now, you are in that life group. Just, just, I, and I hope this is a, a reminder for all of us, maybe something that we know in the back of our minds. I just want to bring it to the forefront. If you're in a life group right now, it's because somebody did this. It's because someone was in a life group and said, we need to multiply. We want to raise up leaders. We want to send out leaders and keep people in our life group to help start new groups that can be healthy. And if you are in a life group currently, to any degree that you have been blessed by a life group that you are in, it is because the people of God have done this. It's because the people of God have embraced this. It's because the people of God have approached current relationships with eternal purpose. And we need you to have that same perspective so that we can continue to connect with and welcome more people into our fellowship via our life groups. I know it's difficult at times to do so. Being in some, I think in all the life groups I've been in, I think we have about five multiplications uh, since the first life group that I have been in. Amen. It is difficult, it is challenging, it is not without, there, there's been tears that have been shed. But at the same time as Christians, it is fitting it is fitting for us to extend the love, to extend to others the love that has been extended to us. That is a fitting thing for us to do. That is a reasonable thing, no matter how difficult and challenging it is. That is a reasonable thing for us to do. We have received that kind of sacrificial love from others. Let us show the same love to others. And for us as Christians, we haven't just received that kind of love from people around us. This is exactly the kind of love that we have received from God himself. The Apostle Paul isn't the first one to leave a place to see others saved when it would have been easier for him to just stay and enjoy the relationship that he had. The reason we're able to know God is because Jesus was willing to abandon heaven. He was willing to come to this earth and suffer because he approached his relationship with you with eternal purpose. This is the, the way he approached his relationship with you. He didn't let the fact that you were different from him stop him from leaving what was comfortable and come to you and welcome you and share his life and the gospel with you. This is what he has done for us. This is the love that we have received. And God being all-knowing, he knew that we'd continue to sin against him and forsake him at times and choose other things over him from time to time. But he was willing to make this sacrifice for us because he approached his relationship with us. He approached his relationship with you with eternal purpose. And while he was on this earth, he shared his life with his disciples for about three years. He didn't just share, but he didn't just share his life with them. And see, in their culture, having a meal with someone was oftentimes a, an extension of hospitality. It was a way of expressing fellowship with someone. And we see Jesus having meals with so many different kinds of people in his ministry. In his time doing ministry, he, did, he had meals with his disciples whom he loved and who loved him. He had meals with Pharisees when many of them oftentimes were against him or bare minimum, they were questioning him. But oftentimes they would leave and plot on how they would destroy him. And he shared meals with them. He shared meals with the religious elite at that time, and he shared meals with those who were known for the sin in their lives. Different kinds of people in different stages of life, in different life circumstances. He extended fellowship and welcome to them. He was willing to share his life with them and share the good news of Jesus with them as well. And then on his last night, he had a goodbye conversation with the leaders that he had been training up for the last three years where he knew he wouldn't see most of them again before his death, as he knew that many of them after the Garden of Gethsemane would scatter and leave him and abandon him. And it is at Jesus' house of mourning, at the Last Supper, at the cross, that we see most clearly that the kind of love that I've been talking about us extending throughout this sermon is the kind of love that Jesus has extended to us. 
He was willing to sacrifice whatever was necessary because he approached his relationship with us with eternal, eternal purpose. And if I'm honest, as I was thinking about what our people needed to hear about this topic, I couldn't help but rejoice in the fact that I believe that a lot of us here, a lot of us in this room, a lot of us who are members of our church have really been willing to sacrifice a lot to share our lives with others and approach current relationships with eternal purpose. I can't get to everyone, so I won't try to do that. But I think about those of us, some in the room now, who have adopted or are going through the adoption process, wanting to share the love of God to children who are in need. I mean, I don't know if I can think of a greater act of sacrificing to share your life with someone else then welcome them into your family. What a, what a glorious way, what a beautiful way to follow God. What a beautiful way to model the same type of love that we see from God himself as he adopts us into his family when he saw us in need. I think about people like Kev and April that have showed a level of hospitality over the years, like sharing their life with others over the years. That is truly mind-blowing. I think of Eb and Jamal and how they've willingly shared their lives and their homes with others in a very similar way. In fact, in fact, I want to give a, I want to share a story with y'all, share something with y'all that I found out about within the last week or so that I just felt was an extremely wonderful example of this. It involves y'all's brother Jamal. Y'all know... So y'all know how during Outreach Week, uh, we, <laughs> amen, during Outreach Week, uh, we have been uh, very intentional, just trying to be a blessing to students at Benedict and try to reach out to them and show love to them uh, and share Christ as well with many of the students there. Um, and I found a podcast uh, by a student named Jojo. I know some of y'all met him at Benedict. And I want to share with y'all <laughs> I want to share with y'all some of the words he said. And this is about how Jamal has shared his life with him and shared Christ with him as well. Uh, he said, anytime I want to hang out and he ain't busy, I can call and, you know, he, we can chop it up and we can hang out. He said, God wanted me and Jamal to meet. Jamal is teaching me stuff about God and the word, stuff that I need to know that I did not know. He says, and I'm really glad, you can if you want to, I'm really glad that I'm able to finally find someone to teach me that type of stuff. He said, and it's good to know that he's only a phone call away, and if I need someone to pray for me, I can just call and be like, hey, yo, bro, because I'm going through a lot, can you just pray for me? He said, and I know that he'll be willing to pray for me because that's just the good in him. He said, or if I just want to get him to pull up and we can just sit outside, and we can talk and he can just pray for me. I know he'll do it because I know that's just the type of person that he is. Hear this. He says, that's all I've been needing in my life. I'm just grateful because I never thought that I was going to find a person like this at Benedict that was going to be there for me that I could call a brother and that I could look up to as a father figure. And God sent Jamal. And like I said, I'm glad for it. He said, God knew that I needed somebody. So that's why he sent Jamal. And like I said, I'm definitely thankful for it. Family, I know that you can do everything that I talked about and not have someone as articulately as that express what God has been doing working through you. But at the same time, my hope was that it will be a reminder of what we hope our life will be like when we get to our house of mourning. When we get to the end of our lives, my hope is that we will see this and know that's what I want the, the dash, the hyphen in between when I was born and when I died, what I want it to be about. I want it to be about God using me as I share my life with others. I'm hoping this will help us kind of zoom out a little bit and get out of the day-to-day -day and ask ourselves, what direction is our, our lives moves, moving in? What is my life truly about? Am I living for and accomplishing what deep down I know my life should be about? You know, if you do a, a quick search and you look up what regrets people often have on their deathbed, one of the things you'll, you'll see continue to come up is that they wish they'd spent more time with people and focusing on relationships. Family, with sermons like this, oftentimes I think we hear a sermon like this and we think, oh, he's just telling me, I got to do more. I'm not doing enough. I got to do more. I'm not doing enough. I got to do more. 
And that's really not what I'm trying to communicate today. I'm not just trying to say, okay, you need to be doing more than what you're doing because you're not doing enough. What I'm trying to do is say, hey, at some point your life will lead to a house of mourning and I don't want you to have those regrets at that time. At some point we will all get to the end of our lives and I don't want you to have the regrets that many are expressing that they have on their deathbed of not focusing on and emphasizing the relationships in their lives and letting the busyness get in the way. I'm trying to help you have less regret. But look back over your life and say, I live my life for what God was calling me to live for. I want you to know the joy of having a kind of impact in people's lives, whether they are able to articulate it to you that way or not. I want that for you. And I want you to know that in times, and there will be times probably this year and, and throughout the years, when I'm asking you to do things like pray about serving as a life group leader. And when I'm asking you to do that, I want you to know that I want this for you that this is what I desire for you. I'm going to ask you to pray about joining our prayer walk ministry from time to time because I want this for you. I'm going to ask you to pray about serving in our kid town ministry or in our preteen group ministry because I want this type of life for you. I'm going to ask you to fellowship deeply in your life group even when it's difficult and tiring and requires a lot of sacrifice because I want this for you. I'm going to ask you to pray about as a life group multiplying so that we can open up more space for more people because I want this for you because I want this for us. And my prayer for us is that we visit the house of mourning of Paul and the house of mourning of Jesus, that we learn what life is really all about and that we'd, enc- we'd be encouraged to share our lives with others while at the same time approaching our current relationships with eternal purpose. Family, y'all pray with me.